This is Larry Benko, W0QE, and this video is the 40th video I've done, and it's on matching and filtering in the same network. The goal here will be to obtain a match at a certain frequency to a certain impedance, and then be able to control the frequency response outside of the area where the match occurs. This is kind of an interesting thing to do, and it's done all the time in uh, output networks and transmitters and stuff like that, but uh, it's a topic that I have not talked about before. In previous videos, I have built matching networks, and in other videos, I've built filters, and both have used circuits and components which are identical. So really, what is a circuit? When I was trying to learn about RF as a kid, there were no answers to a question such as this. There was no internet, and the only choice was to find an Elmer or to read the scant literature that was available. In my case, the supposed experts really were not that knowledgeable or didn't want to be bothered by a non-adult. The limited print information that was available was written by people who couldn't explain the topics clearly enough to me or were more likely really not experts at all. I even had an advantage that my dad was an electrical engineer and my grandfather was a double E professor at the University of Pittsburgh. Unfortunately, they were both experts in AC power and not RF. Fast forward 50 years and everything has changed. We now live in a world where we have great inexpensive test equipment, powerful software that's often free, speedy computers, and a seemingly infinite amount of information about nearly every topic. Now if you wish to learn, the problem is weeding out the incorrect and incomplete information from the good stuff. I do these videos primarily because I wish something similar had been available when I was a kid. The videos use RF examples and show anyone who wants to learn how to do the analysis themselves. In other words, give me the tools, show me how to use them, leave me alone and I'll draw my own conclusions. SimSmith is a great playground for this purpose with the um, adjustability and the sweeping um, capabilities in, in the program. So we can ask ourselves, do all impedance matching networks act as some kind of a filter? Can we build a network that matches that's designed to have an essentially flat frequency response. So let's try to answer both of those questions. What we have here is a pretty much a starting, a starting point SimSmith circuit. We have a generator, we have a load, we have a use Z0 type generator, which is a generator in series with a, an, a resistor of value Z0, which is 50 ohms, and we have a load impedance of 50 ohms. We show one watt being produced in the load because that's what the UZ0 generator produces. We can scale that power, of course, if we want to, but for right now, one, one watt is just fine. Let's go over here to the, to, to the square chart, and we see one watt delivered into the load, and we see the generator SWR being 1.0 to 1. Everything's good. Now, let's suppose we want to try to match this to 75 ohms. Now we see the generator SWR having risen to 1.75, excuse me, 1.5 to 1, the power in the load has dropped from 1 watt to 0.96 watts, which is mismatch, which is mismatch loss. And if we want to make the generator happy and have a perfect 1 to 1 SWR, we can do that by putting a parallel resistor here of magnitude, I think it's 150 ohms. Yeah, 150 ohms. Returns the generator SWR to 1.0 1, 1 to 1. The power now um, delivered to load is lower than it was before. It's 0.667 watts. And the resistor here has a, a power in it of 0.333 watts. The generator delivers the one watt as you'd expect with a 50 ohm equivalent output impedance here. And, it's, and the power is spread across the two components. This circuit, while it matches 75 to 50, it does not, and it, and it matches that over a wide frequency range, it does not look like 70 like 75 ohms looking in from this side from this side looking in we see 50 ohm generator in parallel with 150 ohms which is 37.5 ohms so this circuit looking in this way sees a 2 to 1 swr from a 75 ohm point of view there is a circuit we can build called a minimum loss pad a minimum loss pad will make make a circuit look like 50 ohms looking this direction and 75 ohms from looking at this direction and that circuit looks like, whoops, that circuit looks like this. And you can solve for this, these values pretty easily. Um, it's just, this just happens to be, be a very popular one, uh, circuit. 
it's used a lot if you buy something like a 75 ohm spectrum analyzer and you want to use it in a 50 ohm system. This circuit, which has a loss of, let's convert it just to dB, of 5.72 dB is the minimum loss that you can possibly match 50 to 75 ohms or 75 to 50 with, with both ends looking, looking like the right impedance. So in, in the case where we're on this side, we see 75 ohms. What we see is 50 in parallel with, with 86.6, which is 31.7, added to 43, which is 75. So this, this guy sees 75 looking this way. We look this way, we see 75 plus 43.3, which is 118.3, in parallel with 86.6, which turns out to be 50 again. So this is the minimum loss circuit. This circuit, if we, we, we see the generator SWR beam one to one, the generator power now has been reduced. Let's go back to watts here. Probably easier to understand watts. There we are. The generator power here now is point, point 0.26 watts. And that's the five point, um, 5.1, uh, 5.72 dB loss. If we turn this circuit around and look at it from the 75 ohm point of view, we can do that very simply. We can make this 75, we make this a 50, and we swap the two components, and now the generator over here sees 1 to 1, 1.0 to 1 SWR. We see a power delivered into this resistor now, again of 0.268 watts. 0.268 watts here, and everybody's happy. This circuit is of extremely flat frequency response. You can buy these minimum loss adapters. You can buy them for a couple different other impedances too, but 50 to 75 or 75 to 50 is the most common one. You build it by putting a 75 ohm connector on this end of it. You put a 50 ohm connector on this end of it, and you very carefully, you know, do your do your magic in there, and it's and it's flat in frequency from DC up to you know, as, as, as good as you're capable of being careful with these components inside. Now, this isn't the only circuit that can match 50 to 75 ohms. We can go back again to looking at it from a 50 ohm point of view. We can put a transformer in a circuit. Now, a transformer is kind of an interesting circuit, circuit to put in here. We know we need a turns ratio that is such that the square of the turns is, is such that we get the, the, the impedance ratio. So what we're going to do here is to take, and we need enough inductance in our windings so that we don't have this, ro this roll off at the low frequency. So let's increase our, uh, let's see, the, the R side. Let's increase that up to about, say, 20 microhenries. And then let's just, let's just, let's just manually tune this. And I'm just I'm doing this with the mouse wheel, just scrolling the mouse wheel, and I can control with the with the shift key, the control key, or the control shift, how fast and how slow these things move. But I can tune this circuit until I get an acceptably low SWR. Now the SWR is very very good out here. The power we get to the output is one watt, which is up here. I can make that smaller. Sorry, I can make it smaller so you can see it right here. Everything's good. Small problem though. And the problem we have, this I guess this is really 30 micro 30 microhenries, because it's it'd be the the inductance would be this would be the equal to the turns rate um, the impedance ratio. Um, the problem we have here is maintaining a coefficient coupling of one. There's a different turn there's a difference in turns ratio here, so we can't build this with a transmission line transformer. People like many circuits make this component, and it works quite well, but they make it in a very tiny fashion. It can handle a very small amount of power, but it does work. If the best I've ever been able to do in my life when I've built transformers is get a coefficient coupling like maybe 0 0.99, I don't know. Um, I, can, I can do 0 0.99 usually not too, not too difficultly. Let me make this be a arithmetic change here of say, um, that's good enough. And we see the effect, we see the, let's crank the, this is the power of SimSmith. We can 
So, so here's what I get if I can build a perfect transformer. We see the, the low frequency shunt inductance hurting us at the low end. But, and at the high end, this would go out forever. As soon as though we're no longer capable of making the coefficient of coupling one between the turns here, we see the top end start to get bad. Now, it gets bad if we made these inductances less here, with a, still with a 0.999 coefficient of coupling, we would be better off up here because there'd be less leakage inductance, but we'd have more, we'd have more roll off at the low frequencies. And I can do that by just, let's just, let's make this be 40, 40 microhenries, and we'll make this be 60. And what we see is the, bo the bottom got better because we had more inductance, the top got worse. We can go the other way, or we can go the other way, make this say 10, make this be 15, and now we see the top, even for the same coefficient of coupling, being better than it was before, but the bottom is getting worse, the lower, lower frequencies. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a, um, kind of a balancing act, but we're incapable, in, generally in a transformer, of achieving more than a decade, decade and a half, maybe one in th little bit, a little bit more than a decade and a half in frequency um, at really good performance. What we can do when you have leakage inductance, and let's turn this to a reason, more, much more reasonable number, like 0.995. So this circuit looks really bad up here. What we can do is we can t balance out leakage inductance by parallel capacitors. And this is, this is again, the power of SimSmith. You just basically just play with this stuff. Um, it helps to, have enough, helps to have enough knowledge of the circuit theory that you know, have an idea what to do but once you once you get there, Sim Smith lets you just uh, like, I mean, again, it's like it's like it's like a play block, you know, playground. So this this circuit would work extremely well up to maybe 50 megahertz, and it worked down to one megahertz. That's a 50 to one frequency range with a 0.995 coefficient of coupling. That's a lot of that's a lot of coupling. Um, and it might be hard to do, except in a, maybe a tiny transformer. But this is another circuit which has a pretty flat frequency response. Now let's try some matching with reactive components. And the simplest match we can do is we can use, let's use the automatic L network in SimSmith. And we start see our 75 ohm load, and we see the effect of the capacitor, the parallel capacitor. We see the effect of the series inductor to get us 50 plus J0 in the output, or excuse me, to, on the, to the generator. And this circuit automatically matches to this impedance. It turns out 0, 0 is, is the same as Z0. We could, have put a, we could have put a 50 in here. It wouldn't have made any difference. It would have matched to the same place. If I put a 40 in here, you'll see we'll match to 40 plus J0. But this automatic network will match no matter what you put, out, put over here. If we, if we move this impedance up and around, you can see that it matches. It's a it's a kind of an interesting feature. It's a fairly I don't know. It's it's a fairly recent feature in the history of Sim Smith, but it's it's very practical. And um, so let's go. So here we are. We match to that to from 75 to 50. Now let's look at the frequency response. And let's look at the frequency response. Notice now we we get 0.996 watts out. Um, where before we were getting much less because we had loss in our matching network. Here, this matching network only has a little bit of loss, primarily due to the Q of the inductor, which is set at 200 right now. Um, and it's a Q of 200 with the resistive piece of it rising as a square root of F, which is why we had the frequency here. We can make SimSmith do perfect inductors, a Q that's constant. We can make SimSmith do a Q that tracks with the resistive loss um, due to skin effect. So... This circuit will show us, let's, let's turn this back to dB, because people, when you see a graph like this, people normally like to see dB. Let's say we, we have a, t a 10 megahertz generator that we want to we um, get our power into the load at 10 megahertz, but this generator has some harmonics on it. So we'd like to have our harmonics, which are at 20, 30, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 megahertz, etc., attenuated. But our first harmonic is only attenuated here about 1.44 dB and due to this L network. There's no, no other different values we can use in an L network. It's unique um, to, to do the match. There's, 
we start with it. We start with an impedance. We end up with an impedance. They do not need to be resistive. The the original uh, I may not have mentioned it, but the original minimum loss pad uh, circuit only worked for resistive impedance matched to another resistive impedance. This circuit will ma work from for any impedance to any impedance. Uh, you can match with an L network, two component L network, but you don't have any choice in the component values. We can turn this network into a high pass network. Network, of course, we get this response. But that's even worse than the 1 dB of, of attenuation we had before. Now we have virtually zero. So we definitely want a low pass type of a matching network. And this matching network has one frequency response and only one frequency response, and there's nothing we can do about it. We can alter it a little bit if we make the inductor Q really bad or st something like that. But that's not really what we're, you know, the point of this type of a discussion. Let's change this circuit, though, for a moment into something like a, like a Pi network and see what we can do with a Pi network. So I can do this uh, several different ways. Um, let's, let's get rid of it. I could have done it with two back-to-back -back L networks. Let's do it just, just by drawing the network out in, with individual components and looking at it over here on the Smith chart. We start at 75 ohms, which is right here. The effect of, the C of C1 is the shunt capacitor. The effect of L1 is the series inductor. The effect of C2 is this. Now, Sim Smith, if you have your preferences set to allow to drag tune, you can grab this point, right mouse click it, and just drag it anywhere you want to drag it. And Sim Smith will take this component and this component and adjust them both to make it match. This circuit right here, Gives me, a, gives me a match from 75 to 50 ohms, and let's look at its frequency response. Its frequency response now is at 20 megahertz, is down 13 dB. That's 13.7 dB, and let's remember that number, 13.7. That is how far down it is, with the passband still being basically zero dB, SWR of one to one, at the desired 10 megahertz. So, let's take this circuit in, in increase the Q, or let's decrease the Q first of all. Decrease the Q of this of this network. We decrease the Q of this network by making this capacitor a smaller value. And then dragging it back to where we want it to be. And let's look, look at what we have. Now at 20 megahertz, we're down just about 5 dB. I'm not quite on 20 megahertz there, but that's there. Now, I missed it again. We're basically 5 dB down. Let's make this a higher Q network. We'll make this a, high, we'll make this a higher Q network by basically making that, induct, that capacitor larger. And do this. Now, we can tell it's a higher Q network because it moves further to the outskirts. There are... SimSmith can support Q circles, uh, or arcs, Q arcs, like a Q of five, and we can display that on there. This Q only, and this would be the edge point of an L network. That would be the Q of the edge point of an L network. Not cascaded L networks, not pi networks, not anything else, just an L network. But that's kind of, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I should have done that when we did the L network before. But this circuit now will have more loss at 20 megahertz than 13.7. Now we start to see ripple in the passband, and we see a steeper skirt. We see at 20 megahertz, basically, we're down just about 25 dB. 25, oh, exactly 25 dB. So, if I was asked to build a circuit which took my, past my 10 megahertz signal and attenuated all my harmonics by at least 20 dB, this circuit would be slightly overkill. So let's go back and make this circuit be a little more reasonable. And I'll reduce the Q of it. I'm just changing this capacitor. And um, then I'm going to drag this over here. And this is, this is a little bit of a guessing game here. Well, I got it pretty darn close, though. So that's a little less than, a little less than 20 dB. So we'll raise this up just one notch, say. And there's not, that notch was a 10% change. Again, I've gone through how to adjust the components in SimSmith. And if you learn to make SimSmith basically play with you, you can do this while you talk. You can do it. And I, I do it without even looking at the keyboard. I can adjust all the component values. And that may sound a little bit, I don't know, 
ridiculous, but it's it allows you to concentrate on the circuit. Now we have a little bit more than 20 dB of loss, but let's just let's say that's close enough, 20 dB. Now let's zoom in on this point here and see how broad of our bandwidth we have here. Just because when we build this circuit, we won't get this. We'll get we'll have slightly different values than these than these values, and that will affect our circuit. So let's look at here what we got here. I can zoom in on this circuit, and I've got a one point. 2 to 1 SWR. Let's call that our, our, our threshold of pain. So down here, a one point, let's make, this cir make the SWR curve be higher. Okay, so I have a, I can go all the way from, i got to find one here. That, there's one. That you can only click on points where there's actually a frequency, and I, I did it on 10 megahertz or 100 kilohertz steps. So r roughly 9.7 megahertz to somewhere... 9.7 to 10.25, say, megahertz. So from 9.7 to 10.25 megahertz will be within our, our tolerable SWR band, let's say. So let's, we'll remember that number. I wrote that down here. So now what let's do, let's see if we can do a better circuit than this. We could have turned this into a high-pass Pi network, but if we had done that, I think everyone knows what would have happened. And what would have happened would have been we would have, we would have had... Um, no loss over here, and all the loss would have been on, on the low-frequency side. <clears throat> so let's get rid of all this stuff. And let's start with two cascaded, automatically adjusting L networks. Again, this is really cool in SimSmith. We're not, if you look at this circuit, the first L network does all the work. The next L network has nothing to do. We're not going to allow the first L network to do all the work. So let's set the first L network to do something... I don't know. Let's go maybe to to uh, say um, 60 ohms. So we see the first L network going from 75 to 60, and the second one going from 60 to 50. And both of them are low pass. And now let's look at their look at our graph here. Now now it's kind of interesting. We have, we don't start rolling off until a lot further than we needed to before. But we can fix that. We need to make this circuit be a higher Q. So let's drag this center point, say somewhere up like maybe here. We could have dragged it down to here too. And again, this is stuff you can learn if you play with it for a while. Let's look at this. Now, now we're starting to get closer. We're only down 5 dB at 20, 20 megahertz, but look at the steepness of our of our of our slope here. So let's drag this up a little further and see if that looks even it looks better. Now we're down 12 dB. We have a lot more control than we had before in terms of what we're doing. We have an extra degree of freedom. This is about 17 dB now. A little bit more and we'll have it. That's just about 20 dB exactly at 20 megahertz. Now let's look at our, at our bandwidth down here. Is it better than what we had before or not? nine megahertz to 10.6. Before we had 9.7 to 10.2, now we have nine to 10.6. So this is a wider bandwidth. The wider bandwidth implies that this circuit is less dependent on the value of these components. Now there's four components here, but this circuit has a real appeal, and the real appeal is that I can mess with these values of these components to give me more, more industry standard type values. Before I finish that up, Let's do this. We can also move, make the Q, make the Q be higher by going this way with the circuit, and this will have a different effect than the than the other one had. Notice we have a single single null here in the SWR instead of we had a, like two before. We're not quite, not, don't have quite enough attenuation there. I could move this point over here. I can move it over here. I, you could try lots of stuff. Here we are. We're about about 20 dB down again at 20 megahertz. Nice monotonically increasing attenuation. Let's look at our bandwidth. Here our bandwidth is 9.4, 10.4. It's a little bit narrower than the last one was, but it's more centered on this frequency. Either one of them is perfectly acceptable. But these, these two circuits will allow you to, um, like I said, have more flexibility. So 
Let's, let's use this circuit right now as an example and finish this, finish this off. And the reason we were able to do this is we have four degrees of freedom in our adjustments here. And we don't need to use all of them, so we have um, you know, more, more, more room to play around. We'll take both of these out of the, of the automatic mode. We'll make these components be tunable components. And let's see what we can do with tunable components. 997.1 nanohenries looks to, me, looks to me like I'd go buy a one microhenry inductor. 1.234 microhenries looks like I'd buy a 1.2 microhenry inductor. And those are standard 10% value type, type things. Now I got my capacitors. I want to tune my capacitors to get my SWR down here. And I want to continue to watch this and continue to look at this. And see if we can see if we're able to kind of get everything back to being. Which way do I need to go here? If you had to build a circuit like this and try to analyze it, you'd go crazy. All right. I moved the SWR scale up here before, too. This is what I had before. So now I've got a good SWR. I need to turn these into reasonable values. 360 picofarads is a 5% value. And here, 315 or 3, it's either 300 or 330. Let's try 300 picofarads and see what that does. That's what SWR 1.06 or so. If I make it 330, it's an SWR. That's better. So let's make it a 330 picofarad capacitor. Here's our SWR 1.03. Our passband loss is less than a tenth of a dB. And our 20 megahertz attenuation is above 20 dB. So we met all the specs. We did it with components that are all easily available. The component, sensi component sensitivities aren't as bad. But we have the ability to adjust our frequency response while still maintaining the match if we put enough components in our circuit. That was the point I was trying to make uh, in this example. Hopefully people will find this interesting and useful. SimSmith has got a lot of really interesting things you can do. And if you sit down and have some kind of a, some kind of a project you're working on and you start playing, with it for a little while, you can really get some insight in how, into how the circuits work. And I find that to be, uh, it's, it's almost addictive to say the least. Again, if you like the video, please, please, you know, click on the thumbs up button, subscribe if you wish. Um, and I appreciate as usual, any comments. Thank you very much.